In the last few months, businesses have had to figure out how to pivot quickly to adjust to this ever-changing situation. And this brings to mind a quote for me by um, Tony Shea, CEO of Zappos. A big business is like a ship. There's lots of amenities and it can go further, but it's harder to turn quickly. Well, imagine that you're at the helm of leading a 500,000 person company and you have a workforce and clients all over the world while a global pandemic is unfolding. Well, that's the position today's guest found herself in this spring, but she stepped up and she handled it with the three C's, compassion, care, and confidence. Good morning, I'm Leah McGowan-Hare and welcome to another one of our live weekly conversations as part of our Leading Through Change series. A chance for you to hear from business leaders who are doing their best to navigate through this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, before I turn it over to our awesome host today, Salesforce Chair and CEO, Mark Benioff, I wanna preview the next hour. Now, Mark will be interviewing Julie Sweet, the CEO of Accenture, and how she is helping to maneuver her 500,000 person company with agility during this crisis and helping customers turn massive challenges into meaningful change. Now, while we'll, we'll also have a special presentation on how you can reopen your business and your community safely with the help of work.com. And finally, we'll conclude with a special performance by Alicia Keys exclusively on Salesforce Live. So for those of you watching on Twitter, you're gonna wanna join us at salesforce.com slash live to see that portion of the show. Now, as we do every week, we wanna make sure on Leading Through Change, we are working to help those that need it the most. So millions of people are already relying on United Nations food program for their food to survive. And COVID-19 is making these conditions even worse. This pandemic could double the number of people suffering from severe hunger by the end of the year. We don't want a food pandemic to a hunger pandemic. So to help prevent us, please join us in supporting the World Food Program. And they're trying to reach at scale 100 million people across 86 countries with life-saving support. Now, if you can, please go to salesforce.com slash WFP and join us in ensuring that the world's most vulnerable people can have enough to eat during this crisis. Now through July 31st, 2020, Salesforce will be matching donations up to $150,000. Again, that's salesforce.com slash WFP. With that, over to you, Mark. Well, hello everybody. And it's uh, great to be back with you on Leading uh, Through Change. This is an amazing series. It's uh, been watched now by tens of millions of people around the world. Incredible. And look, I want to especially thank you, Leah, for what you've been doing on this series, bringing us all together and uh, hosting us. You've done a, just a phenomenal job with the series, Leah. So thank you so much for your incredible energy and inspiration and vision and everything you're doing. And you're right, today's show is fantastic. We have three amazing people who are going to be joining us today over the next hour. And uh, that includes Julie Sweet, the CEO of Accenture. We're also going to be joined by Jujar Singh of Salesforce and, of course, uh, incredible Alicia Keys. And uh, for the Alicia Keys portion, as Leah said, we're going to be shifting over to salesforce.com slash live. So make sure that you shift over with us to hear the amazing music of Alicia Keys. But let me tell you right now, we have an amazing guest, a great friend, a great partner, a good friend of mine, and uh, she's just an amazing leader. I'm so happy to see her as the CEO of Accenture, Julie Sweet. Uh, Julie and I have so many things in common and we also spend so much time working to guide our customers and our partners in their digital transformations. Um, it's been so much fun to team up with her to do incredible things, but I'll tell you, it's really our common values that have really guided us and especially 
the deep commitment that she's had to equality, diversity, and inclusion at Accenture. Uh, Julie has been called by many different organizations the most powerful female CEO in corporate America, and I would have to agree with that. Uh, but the truth is she's one of the most powerful, inspiring leaders probably in the whole world. So Julie, we're so happy to have you with us today. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. And um, those are way too kind of words, but you know, you've been a real inspiration to me. Um, I became our global CEO not that many months ago. And as I was uh, kind of learning and, and changing over the last few years, your, uh, your leadership, you know, which is so well exemplified by today's program, which is bringing people together, but it's also supporting organizations in the community. And uh, that's one of the things that I think you've actually helped change, you know, the whole way that corporate America and uh, corporate across the globe thinks about our role. So, you know, a lot's been talked about stakeholder capitalism and I, and I mean this sincerely, and I've told you this off camera as well. So this is just, um, you know, your example of how you've led the company and how you've done your investments and what you talk about, uh, I think has, has been an important part of the movement and is never more important than right now, where we need to all make sure that we're finding purpose and that we're not letting things like equality and sustainability uh, lose focus uh, as we as we move forward as a world. Well, uh, Julie, you're right. You know, CEOs have a choice. Uh, they can choose to kind of reflect and be part of the mantra of Milton Friedman: "The business of business is business." That stakeholder, that is uh, kind of stakeholder capitalism. So I would say greatest challenge, stakeholder capitalism, is really the business of business is improving the state of the world. And kind of these two thoughts that you're either about shareholders or you're about stakeholders, well, I think in many cases, it's just a false choice. And I'll have to say, Julie, it's really your leadership that has illuminated that. You, you, you have inspired so many CEOs to become stakeholder CEOs, to think about the bigger world, how they are going to see their role in the world is not just generating a tremendous uh, earnings per share and corporate profit, which you've done, but also using your business as such a great platform for change. How you have done that at Accenture has really inspired me. So let me just ask you, you know, look, this has been such a challenging time. You know, we're, we're facing just an unprecedented moment. What, what has guided your response to this crisis? Well, sort of, I, you know, one of the things I'd say at the very beginning, right, um, uh, one of the things that we had to rapidly do was, uh, was to start focusing on the future because there's a tendency to mourn what's lost, right? And uh, to give you some sense of it, when we, uh, when the pandemic was just declared March 11th, we just finished our second quarter. We have a different fiscal year. It was the biggest sales quarter in our history. I did earnings eight days after the pandemic, right? No one asked me about Q2, right? Like they, because it was something else. And it was one of those things where, you know, new leadership team, all of these exciting things that we were doing. And we had to say, look, we, we need to face where we are and embrace the future and move forward and bring our organizations along. And I think it's important it's true in our personal lives, you know, it's true, you know, my ch my daughter is graduating from sixth grade and isn't having her little graduation, which is, you know, think of all the high school students and the college students, and it's a really, really tough time. And just as a leadership team and with our people, making sure that we can embrace a future, and there's a very tough reality now, uh, but at the same time, you see so many great things happening around the world and people coming together. You know, the work we're doing, you know, um, in the state of Massachusetts, where for the first time ever, you know, uh, the state, you know, the first movers were to create the contract tracing and we brought this together and we're bringing, and, and it was just such an example of people coming together quickly. Uh, and so I think there's, you know, it's, it's really important to do that. And then the other thing I just do as a leader is I remember that my job is not to put stress in the system. And so being calm at this time is really important because we are facing tough things. And, uh, and so that's one of the things that I constantly tell myself as a leader is my job is not to add to the stress. Well, Julie, you know, uh, you're right. Uh, we are mourning the past and, uh, you know, we've all walked uh, through a door in, into the future 
And I think for many of us, we think that the, the past is coming back somehow, that this is going to be magically over, or everything's going to be back exactly as it was, but it's not. It's, it is quite a bit different here in the future than it was just a few months ago. And it feels like we're in a very much of a digital world right now. I mean, that's evidenced by this program. We're not doing this on, on a stage in San Francisco with thousands of people. We're doing this over Zoom. You know, we're in a digital first world. And also we're in a kind of a work anywhere world. I'm in my home, you're in your home. We're, we're, we're doing these things, you know, um, in, in kind of anywhere we wanna be. And we're using the technology to augment this. And I know that's been a, such a huge vision for you and your company to help companies make that leap from the past and into the future and to be a digital first company and to help them create you know, these work anywhere environments. Let me ask you, Julie, what has been your greatest challenge in helping companies to, or organizations? I think you're also working with, you know, a lot of public sector organizations. I, I know we're doing some of that work together. You know, during this time, what, what has been your biggest challenge to helping organizations make that leap? Well, you know, Mark, I think in many ways, um, what I thought would be the biggest challenge was how slow companies, uh, you know, operate. I think what's been is is not actually occurred, and and it's been incredible to see. In fact, many CEOs are saying to me, "I don't want to go back because they've seen how the entire organization can move really fast." But there is something happening, and uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about digital acceleration, and it can become as danger of becoming a bit of a cliche, but there's something real that's happening. So if you take what we're doing at um, Together at a Bank, pre-crisis, Salesforce and Accenture were helping a major bank move from being all about products to be all about customers, a familiar story, right? Big transformation. Well, the crisis hits and all of a sudden, that bank's small businesses and their people, they have questions. How do they access the relief program? How do they get their checks posted quickly? The bank was you know, overwhelmed. And together, very quickly, with the power of all of us, we were able to you know, um, put used Einstein bot to a, a put in something, a virtual agent to answer the questions rapidly overnight, right? And then on top of that, I remember when you announced Dreamforce, um, the, the fact that Salesforce would now be able to connect into AWS Connect in the fall, remember that, right? Well, all of a sudden, we had to have the agents who were going to still answer calls work from home. And so we were doing all of that. Now, I will tell you, pre-crisis, we would have said that was a challenge. But here is a bank that had been investing, who had good partners, and we worked together. And now what's happening, because we're moving out of response, to rethink transformation. We're working with that same bank to say, look what we achieved. Can we think about that same program that we were working on pre-crisis and now do it in smaller increments to drive faster value because we just experienced how to do it. And I think what, what um, companies are really you know, finding, and it's true as well in the public sector, is that you can actually achieve faster. Now, transformation still is a longer path, right? You don't, if we could transform in 90 days, we would have done it, right? But how you get there is different. And so I think it's really exciting to see the opportunity of how we've come together and had a great outcome. Because you know, for our people together who worked on that, what they're talking about right now is how they helped small businesses get what they needed, right? And then now it's say, well, what else can we do together to transform quickly and with more value? Well, Julie, that is such a great story. And, um, you know, it's so powerful. And I know we've done so much work with these banks just in the last 90 days and helping them to issue, for example, all these amazing loans that they've been doing and, and also participating in these government programs and working with partners that we have like Encino and others, that that's such a, a powerful moment to see them have to spin up and create systems instantly that have really affected, you know, our, our entire economy. Has that surprised you? Well, I, um, I, you know, in terms of the surprise, it's, uh, it's less about the surprise and more about the scale, right? Where I say, cause I think that, you know, what it's really done is we've always talked about partnerships and the power of technology, uh, but the scale at which we did it in that speed has been really, really fantastic. Uh, I also think what we're seeing is 
how what agile really means. If you take the work that we did first starting in Massachusetts and now uh, creating the emergency response management program that I know Judar is going to show later, that was a spin that up, test, learn, and continue to do features. It's sort of the epitome of the cloud, right? But very, very rapidly, you know, and as we've expanded it to um, uh, to different states and you know California, Louisiana, you guys continue to have you know new features that we're working on together, and uh, we're seeing that even in how companies are now reopening, right? So we're starting manual. We have lots and lots of companies we're working with right now who can't wait for the technology to be implemented, even if it's short. But then we're taking those learnings and we're building it in with you guys into uh, work.com so that we can quickly implement it. And you're seeing that in so many different places, you know, in the healthcare where, um, com you know, the, uh, they, they're learning and testing it, you know, the telemedicine and so on. And I think it's putting us on a different path. And the speed at which that change is surprising because we were all talking about agile organizations and how you test and learn and do that. And now you have over almost overnight organizations embracing it uh, as a new way of working. And I think it's, you know, I talk a lot about the need for resolve because what we don't want to have happen is the, the hardest part of the crisis past the first stage of response and then we do go back, you know, and many of the CEOs are saying they don't want to. And so what does that mean? It means that we all need to think about how do we make decisions and how do we institutionalize these changes as we move forward? And I think that's part of the next phase of what we all need to do to capture the good of, uh, of, of how we've responded together. Julie, I think that's so interesting, and I'll tell you why it, it's so powerful for me, which is that, you know, if you had asked me 90 days ago what contact tracing was, I didn't really know. I mean, I know that we worked on something five years ago, and uh, that, that was for the CDC when SARS was happening. never got deployed because SARS basically got extinguished. And then all of a sudden, to get the phone call from so many states and so many organizations that we would have to deploy contact tracing because it's a critical way of extinguishing the virus. We need to wear a mask. We need to practice social distancing. Uh, we need to wash our hands. And we also needed to, to use co contact tracing in coupling with testing so that we test. And then also we have the opportunity to contact people who maybe have been with somebody who's had a positive test. And, and now to see so many states, like especially the ones that you've mentioned and many, many others basically say we need immediately to scale up contact tracing system that will kind of create a whole contact tracing core for hundreds of thousands, you know, of people who are going to be able to do that all over the, the uh, country. That's amazing to me. I, I would never have thought that in a million years that we could actually build and deploy that quickly. You've been such a key part of that in the development of work.com. Has that surprised you as well? It has. It, it really has been, uh, you know, amazing, particularly because it's it's not something that you simply do. As you said, 90 days ago, we would have said, really, you know, you know, what exactly is that? And to do that, it really takes, you know, a group of people who understand the health component, who understand, understand how public sector uh, is uh, operates, who understands how the private sector operates, who gets privacy concerns. I mean, the way that it's been built so that in fact people can both protect their privacy and yet we can achieve these public health outcomes has really been extraordinary. And that is something I think that we should all be surprised at and learn from, right? Because what you just described happening is was incredibly complicated and yet done very, very rapidly. And uh, and you know, so it's exciting and, and it's this part of like embrace the future, right? Just think about the other things. Like we'll take the hunger, um, you know, what that we, that Leah started with. I mean, as you know, right now we're working together with um, an organization, Not Impossible Labs, under the Hunger Not Impossible, to and we built together um, an, an app that allows us to connect people who are hungry with restaurants where there's prepaid food, and we've now rolled that out together um, with this organization in three cities. You know. 
very rapidly. I mean, this was done in days, right? And I believe that it's those kinds of solutions that are being inspired by these larger things that people are seeing. And so now let's start to think about, you know, education and the, uh, and the new opportunities where we can come together both in our businesses to help our, you know, our clients and, you know, do the very important things, but also to find uh, more answers to areas that have been a bit intractable in the, in the, in the past. And that's where I think, you know, we, we talk about, you need to face the reality of what we're in. We have a very tough reality. We are going to have some tough times ahead, right? Both health and economics, but there is also uh, some extraordinary opportunity to uh, work together as society, as governments and as businesses to make lasting improvements. Well, I think you're so right. You know, when I think about over the last three months, if you had asked me what we would be doing at Salesforce, I would have never could have possibly imagined what was happening. I mean, my probably mo one of my most shocking moments was we received a phone call from Sam Hoggood, who's the chancellor of UCSF here in San Francisco, is our major medical uh, system and university. And Sam basically said, hey, I want to uh, in, in help you. I want you to get involved in something. I said, well, what is it, Sam? He's like, you need to understand we're running low on PPE. I'm like, well, I don't know. What is PPE? I had never heard of a PPE before. Well, of course, that's masks, that's gloves, that's gowns. And what had happened is because of all the increased activity in the emergency rooms, he was already starting to get quite low on PPE in March before anything had really started. And I said, all right, well, I'll help you and I'll make some phone calls. And I was very fortunate to find one of our common friends, you know, Daniel Zhang, the CEO of Alibaba, who said, oh, I'm gonna make sure that you are prioritized and we'll make sure that you get PPE. And um, we've, of course, acquired now more than 60 million pieces of PPE, distribute that to more than 300 hospitals in the last couple of months. If you had asked me that we would be involved in that or that we'd have to make that a priority for our organization, it, I wouldn't have thought it would be, even be possible. And, and then you look at this other part of it, which is so many organizations, nonprofit organizations like we were talking about, public sector organizations, commercial organizations, having to rapidly build and deploy applications and technology to help them manage information in the middle of a crisis. Well, I was surprised we had to get involved with 11,000 of them and do something really critical for them. And we had built a whole program around that called Salesforce Care to help them rapidly deploy these systems. That was amazing to me. And then the third thing, which you know we've been so, so deeply involved with you, which is to help companies now get back to work safely. So companies want to do things like contact tracing. So if they have an employee who gets a positive PCR test, they want to let other employees know who have been with that employee that day. Hey, uh, you know, you want to uh, get checked yourself because you know your colleague would, had a positive test or shift scheduling because not every company is going to be able to bring back the entire workforce, you know, at one time in the same day. I know that's even going to be true for schools that our schools are thinking about to try to you know make density in classrooms not as high. They're going to have kids in school in shifts. So of course you might have team one, team two, team three, and on Monday team one is in, on we on Tuesday team two is in, and on team on Wednesday team three is in, and then all of a sudden, you know, it turns out there's somebody has a positive infection on team one. Well, team one is off, and now only team two and team three are coming in, and team one is quarantined for 14 days. That's an application I never even thought thought of before. I can't even believe that there is going to be such a thing, and of course. We have this other one, we have this very nasty thing in San Francisco in, at Salesforce Tower called elevators. So we're not gonna be able to pile 20 people into our elevators when they come in for work. They're gonna have to queue up. So the night before you're gonna take your temperature, you're gonna tell us you're coming in. We're gonna say to you, hey, guess what? Um, uh, you're, you're queued for the elevator at 10.15. You know, then you're gonna get up to the seventh floor. You're probably not gonna move around between multiple floors. That's also that if all of a sudden, again, if somebody ends up with a positive infection, you can at least tell everyone on floor seven, hey, you're not coming in tomorrow, but floors eight, nine, and 10, they can. So these are things where technology is gonna augment our experience, 
to help us get back to work safely. And uh, that, that's an exciting project that we've been able to work on with you because I do want to help everyone get back to work safely, get the economy going again. And um, I think information technology can help a surrogate not quite having a vaccine yet. So that's uh, something that I'm excited that we're partnered with. And, and tell me, how, how are you thinking about that? Uh, well, absolutely. And we're excited too, because it, it feels um, great to be a part of helping companies get back to work. Right. And, uh, you know, I know our teams are uh, super uh, thrilled to be doing that. And, you know, one of the things that we're really been thinking through with you is that while the the, the issues are common, like we, we need to do contract tracing, you know, regardless of industry, but how do you do that within the industry and what's the need of the manufacturer versus a service company versus a retailer versus a school and how you can build this backbone and then implement it, you know, for the different uh, industries, right? Using what's common, but having that kind of real understanding of how it's going to be different. And uh, one of the things that has been helpful is as we've helped people start to do this in a manual way, right? The relief to know that the technology is going to be here because, you know, no matter what people understand, this is not temporary, right? We are looking at a fair amount of time. And, you know, I think one of the things that we're also seeing is that many of this is going to have applicability even beyond a vaccine because it's also helping uh, bring efficiencies to how you manage people, the way you look at things, automating and, you know, bringing information together in ways that, you know, you could only dream of before. Uh, and so I, I do believe that you know, taking mental possession of the fact that this isn't temporary and that we need to think about it you know, in a, from a longer term and make it easier on people uh, is also a part of the embracing of the future. Um, and one thing I just want to add, uh, Mark, is that not only was it extraordinary what you did with PPE and, and working with Daniel and that, but you know, some of the things that people don't know, like I remember the call, we're both members of the business roundtable. We get our, um, which in the US is kind of 200 of the biggest companies. And we get together every week to talk and share. And I remember early on when you made that offer to all of us to say, look, I've got this. And for those of you who are struggling in the early days of the crisis, have essential workers, need to keep you know, things open, let me know and let me give you what we have, right? Because in those early days, it didn't matter who you were, right? We needed in our healthcare workers needed, but we needed, you know, we were still had some manufacturing over, uh, open. We had people out in the field. We had not yet, you know, my mother is amazing. She's making tons of masks, you know, for people now, but that was, you know, before then. And, um, and it was just great. And I think it shows you some of the incredible things that are coming out of this, right? Is I could also not have imagined that call, right? This is, hey, here, if you need it, let me know. Right, and I know people took you up on it because they did need it, uh, and uh, I, and I do think you've got a new level of collaboration uh, between companies, uh, between competitors. You know, really to say, how do we solve? You know, together for what's happening. So thank you for that. Well, Julie, you know, today is a Time Magazine, which is a double issue that I'm so excited about. Is about Generation Pandemic. And my heart has really been with all these kids who have not been able to go to their graduations and not go to school for the last couple of months. And, you know, our, the cover talks about a global cr a crisis that's changed their lives and how they're responding. Uh, uh, and also how they respond will change the world because I think so much of the future will actually be influenced by these kids who are going through something that I never went through before. This is my first pandemic. But for these kids who are now going, they're on school, you know, in Zoom, or they're going through a graduation ceremony virtually, you know, their life has been interrupted. And I think that when we look at these kids, when we look at teens, you know, we're hearing their words and how they're looking at this and how they're looking at the future quite differently. Has that, has that impacted you? 
Well, it, you know, so I, you know, I have a niece who was uh, graduating from high school and not only is she not graduating, but she doesn't know if school's starting in the fall, you know, uh, my, my daughter who's, who's in sixth grade. And so it seems so small, but they have this really special graduation that, you know, she saw her sister do the year before and now she doesn't get to do it. And of course these seem in many ways so small when you see the suffering of the people who are out of work you know, the lines, um, you know, at the food pantries and that. And, and, you know, I think as a parent, we try to get a lot of balance, you know, in our lives to sort of say, to, to acknowledge what that feels like as, you know, as the sixth grader, but to also, you know, educate. And I, I know that's been a struggle. My daughters are 12 and 13. And early on, I think we sheltered them more because we didn't want them to be afraid. But as, the size of the pandemic and the suffering has come, we found ways to really talk about it with our children because to your point, um, they will be our, our future leaders. And I think learning at this time, understanding, growing their compassion, uh, you know, our, our, you know, we asked our daughters to, you know, select places where we could give, find ways we can volunteer, uh, and have them lead it because we want them to connect with it in a different way um, and not just have it my generation. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of discussion and, and worry, frankly, about those going into the workforce now and what the effect is. But I do think there's an opportunity for all of us to build in this compassion and empathy to be a part of how our children grow up. And so, that's one of the things I'm, I am trying to get that right balance for them not to be afraid, but for them to learn. Uh, and, uh, and so to be part of a different world going forward. Well, Julie, you know, we're a few minutes away from hearing Alicia Keys. Uh, you know that she's uh, one of my very favorite artists in the whole world. And I'm really looking forward to hearing her. And she's going to, we're going to switch over to salesforce.com slash live in a moment. We're going to have an opportunity to hear from her, but you know, she has some, a famous song. And, you know, when I hear that song, I always think about you, Julie, because here you are, you are at the helm, the CEO of one of the very largest companies in the world. You are perhaps the most powerful CEO in the world. And when I hear Alicia sing that song, I always think about you and all, everything that you are doing uh, in your life. And it's so powerful to see your leadership. So, Julie, now that you've become this incredible chief executive officer of Accenture, can, can you tell us what, what has inspired you in your career and what is your advice for women like yourself who are you know, becoming the leaders uh, that we need going forward? Well, thanks, uh, it's way too kind, but um, I'll tell you, you know, I'm actually, really inspired by my parents. Um, my, uh, my mom graduated from college when I was a freshman in college. My father never graduated from high school. And when I left for college, so um, my, my, my dad said to me, don't be afraid to embrace new things. Just never forget where you came from. And uh, I really think of that in my new life as a CEO as don't forget our people. And uh, you know, we we talk a lot about Accenture. It's human plus machine, people first. Uh, but right now, you know, that lesson from my dad and um, in the in the in what my parents used to do. They used to say, "We don't have money, but we have time." So we always we grew up serving. Uh, is uh, I think all of us as leaders, and no matter what we do, whatever level of leadership, um, we just have to remember. Uh, it's people first and to show the compassion and the empathy. And so I think as, as leaders, uh, that that's what, you know, men are women that we have to remember, never forget where you came from. Don't forget the people. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in what I've done in my life and I have incredible leaders. Uh, and I guess I'll close with one story. Uh, when the Philippines was closing, and we had to get people enabled from home. We had two people who stayed and helped with workers and then they all looked around, 50, 60 people and they couldn't get home because they'd stayed to be enabled because they knew their clients needed them. 
but all the transportation was done. And those two of the people had cars and they drove all night for hours driving people home, you know? And, uh, and so in all of this, it's not the leaders like us, right? It's the people on the front lines who are really the, the heroes. Uh, and so that's what inspires me every day. Thanks again, Mark, for your leadership, uh, for having this and for the privilege of getting to hear Alicia Keys um, uh, and her great work. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Julie. And, uh, you know, I was watching an incredible program last night about Cesar Chavez. And what you said is something that he always said, which is it's always about the people. And um, I uh, really resonate with those words of, of uh, vision and leadership and values from you and the inspiration that you're leaving us with. So thank you so much for everything. And uh, we are, we're about to hear from Alicia Keys on salesforce.com slash live. But before we do, we're going to see an amazing project that we've been working on with Accenture, which is building this incredible new service called work.com. We're all trying to get to back to work safely. And one of the most important ways to get back to work safely is having the information technology that's going to let us rapidly get back into our offices while all being uh, safe at the same time. I'm delighted to have an expert on that uh, with us today, which is uh, Jujar Singh. Jujar, welcome. You know, you have been extraordinary over the last several months and how you've responded to the crisis has just been uh, incredible. And I just would love for you to tell us a little bit about how we should think about getting back to work safely and what are some of the things that we can do in our offices that are gonna help us to make that happen now. Thanks, Mark. I'm calling from my home office where I've been since March and I look forward to the reopening very quickly. As businesses are trying to reopen, they are looking for tools as well as best practices. And this is where the Salesforce team has been hard at work in work.com trying to build these applications. I'm going to preview a few of them. Work.com is a central place where thought leadership articles, best practices, data, as well as tools are there. And incredible partners like Accenture are actually building a lot of those products and applications too. Thanks to Julie and team, we actually have co-developed a product. As communities are trying to look for reopening, they are constantly asking about contact tracing. Mark, you also pointed that out. But we have to look at contact tracing, not in isolation, but in a much more holistic fashion. This is where we have built emergency response management for public health, launched it on May 19th. So let's dig in and look at that. The first part about reopening is all about data. Understanding the data, where are the hotspots, understanding it at the macro level is key. But not only that, making the actual people, the individuals responsible and making them a proactive part about their own journey. So Lucia Hernandez is an individual who's feeling sick. She starts her journey on the website. As she starts her journey, Einstein bots kick in. They actually help her self-triage. Think about how much impact and less pressure will go on our health infrastructure. It helps us scale much better. The information so collected then is brought back where the healthcare professional can actually look at it. They go through a guided process flow informed by CDC guidelines. And lo and behold, Lucia is now symptomatic. At this point of time, she's worried. Where can I get tested? The system at this point of time actually suggests the next best action that on-site testing would be great. With a few clicks, Lucia actually can schedule a test appointment. And unfortunately, she's COVID-19 positive. At this stage, the healthcare worker actually can see a complete picture of her health, her pre-existing conditions, the medications she is taking, she can, the healthcare worker actually can see that she is quarantined. They put the proper care management protocols, but at the same time, understanding the impact of Lucia on the whole ecosystem is equally important for reopening. So this is where we hand over the baton to the contact tracers. The contact tracers in a visual fashion can understand both sides. On the one hand, understand the households, but also the interactions that she has had with the community. Understanding those interactions is extremely key 
in a visual way, you can understand people who are quarantined, who are being monitored. And with this whole thing, you can add new encounters extremely quickly, whether they are individual en encounters or group encounters. At this point, it is also equally important for us to understand Lucia's social barriers. So Lucia in this particular case is a single mother, quarantined. She needs essentials to be brought in to her. This is where the emergency service managers can look at a cluster of these requests, use Salesforce maps and assign them to field workers. The field workers can actually see all these requests show up on their map and with a few clicks, they deliver the essential commodities to Lucia at her home. So in this quick harbor cruise, you saw how a holistic approach to contact tracing makes the reopening extremely easy. Quick test schedules, getting the individuals involved, getting contact traces to understand the impact, and then finally delivering the essential commodities to everyone in place. That's the power of what we are delivering. We'll accelerate the reopening. We are going to be out in the open very soon. With that, if you need more tips as well as tools, go to work.com. Back to you, Leah. Okay, well, I want to ask you one question before sure, we, Mark. if that's okay, Jutar. You know, having someone like you online with us is so powerful. We have Julie, now we have you, we're about to have Alicia Keys. Jujar, I want to ask you this question. You know, we hear about contact tracing, and of course, we also hear about it in some Asian countries where it's quite automated, you know, where we don't have the same kind of privacy and civil liberties and rights that we have here in the United States. So all of a sudden, if you get a positive test, everyone that you've been with automatically is notified, you know, well, that's not how it goes here in the United States, right? So when you're talking about contact tracing, it's not automated like that. You're talking, it sounds like you're talking about contact tracing that is technology coupled with human tracers. So that's going to almost create this contact tracing core of hundreds of thousands of people maybe here in the United States who are going to be employed to be contact tracers, you know, helping to communicate uh, how to take care of each other as a community. Is, is that the right way to think about it? Help me understand contact tracing, automated versus manual. Absolutely, Mark. I think for what we are delivering out of the box is the manual contact tracing. Salesforce through the work.com is a relationship oriented company. We understand all the impacts. And our firm belief is that the privacy of any individual is equally important. And our belief is the automated process actually may not be the right way, bringing the humans and an empathetic approach in manual contact tracing is extremely important. So that's what we are investing in. But as I mentioned, it's not just the contact tracing piece. It's getting those individuals involved at a personal level, getting their consent, and then tying it back to making them, taking care of all of the social barriers. We see all of them as one holistic picture, driven by privacy, but very empathetic at the core. Well, Jujar, thank you for everything that you're doing. You have been a critical uh, leader over the past several months, and I know you've also recently been promoted to be a major executive uh, in the company. So congratulations as well on your promotion. We're also delighted for you, but your leadership has just been inspiring and it's saving lives as you see your technology has already been deployed in so many states, including uh, Rhode Island and California and others. And to see what you've done, it's been just incredible. Thank you, Jujar, and thank you, Julie Sweet. It's been an incredible uh, leading with change program. You know, I was so inspired by Julie and how she's using her business as a platform for change. And now also hearing from Jujar on his tremendous leadership and how he and his team have really helping so many both public and private institutions reopen safely. Now you can find more about leading through change stories at salesforce.com slash blog. And before we wrap up, one more reminder to join us in making sure millions of people worldwide do not go hungry during this crisis. If you can, just whatever you can give, please go to salesforce.com slash WFP and join us in helping this organization. 
through July 31st, 2020, Salesforce will be matching donations up to $150,000 US. Again, that's salesforce.com WFP. Now, we'll be back with more shows after the holiday weekend. So enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. Take care of yourself and each other.